Any prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. How many unspokens do we have? Lord knows those. Let's, um, let's continue to pray for Pastor Dave for healing. It was great to see him here today. And uh, he, I'm, that's a miracle, you know. It really is. Um, let's pray for those who... Have, we got a lot of folks who are sick with this pollen and so forth, so we want to remember them. Um, remember... Um, yeah, remember Brittany. Uh, pray for her. Pray for the, the family. Just, but especially pray for her and her health. Um, Remember our missionaries, and I know I've mentioned this several times, but especially the ones in the Philippines. Uh, we have a lot of missionaries in the Philippines that are in uh, Muslim areas, and they are constantly facing persecution. And so please pray for them. Uh, whenever you think about it, just lift them up. The Lord knows which ones. I can't pronounce their names, some of them. So, but the Lord knows, their, knows who they are. And um, it seems like whenever we go through election cycles, election years, that the Islam, for whatever reason, is really against our missionaries. And so just, just remember that. Anybody else, any other prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. Yes, keep praying for Israel. And um, we pray for our country, too, and our, our leadership. We, um, we're in not the best position to be right now. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yeah, Jan's got bronchitis, so remember Jan. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, we're about to have some more babies in the nursery. Yeah, that's always a good thing. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Anyone else? All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'll read this, this list of names. Does anybody want to open us up, start us out, open us up? Thank you, Larry. Father, we thank you for the privilege that you've given to us uh, and just the burden that you've given to us to pray for these lost folks. And Lord, you know where they are. You know right where they are this evening. You know their spiritual condition. And Lord, you know and only you know what's, what it's going to take for them to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And I pray, Father, as we pray for these names week after week, that we would truly lift them to you and we are truly asking you to have mercy on these souls and to send someone to plant the seed, to water the seed. And Father, that you would save the, these sinners that are nearest hell. Father, we lift up Beck and Nick and Gary, Britton, Avaya, Sophia, Savannah, Mason, Jimmy, Tristan, Katie, Alexis, Tabitha, Deanna, Juliana, Eric and Jim, Teresa, Desiree, Darlene, Chris, Ken, Melissa and Angel. We lift to you Caitlin, Carter and Joseph, Jackson, Jordan, Jason, Amanda, Abigail, Lillian, Madison, David, and Debbie, Lori, George, David and Jennifer, Isabella, Madeline, Camden, Coulter, Leanna, Denise, and Larry, Jason, Dan, Lacey, and Neil, Scott, Robin, and Davey, Connie, AJ, Rachel, and Patrick, Laura, Chris, Dean, Randy, Trey, Curtis, Larry, April, Neil, Heather, and Beth, Destiny and Justin, Corey, Wendy, Langston, Blake, and Kathy, David, Kenneth, Chad, and Andy, Robert and Tori, Heather, Chris, Susan, Stacy, Emery, Ellie, Shepherd, Beth, James, Renee, Wayne, and Beth and Serenity, Kim and Lee and Elaine, Olivia, Gary, James, 
Willie and Eddie, Greg and Michael, Winter, Michael, Hazel, Pat, Paige, and Aaron, Grant, Rebecca, Ashton, Tress, Alan, Timothy, Andrew, Brittany, and Marcus, David, Brandy, and LaDawn, Brandon, Danielle, Dean, and Jasper, Silas and Jennifer, Chris, Beth, Ronald, Patty, Jackie, Kasim and his family, Brittany, Kenny, Dylan, uh, Damian, Wyatt, Bryson, Monica, Blaine, and Je uh, Jennifer, Fred, Andrea, Margaret, Autumn, and Faye, Melissa, Donnie, Dave, Jessica, Mason, Jackson, Jeremy, Luke, Anna, and Nova, Mary, Jimmy, Jackson, and Jason, Jalen, Ben, Michael, Jacob, the Larkin family and the Oscar family, Chuck, Heather and her two children, Christopher, uh, Nikki, Alexis, Nicholas, Kingston, Summer, Haley, Casey and Kimby and Kinsley, Landon, Arona, Layla, Denny, uh, Dennis, Blake, Gabby and Tony, Emily and Cody, Penny, Brittany, the family of Pastor Eve, David, the Christopher family, Penny, Brian, Kevin, Carol, Hunter, and Wally. Father, once again, we just thank you for the privilege of praying for these. And we ask you, Lord, that you would send us, send someone to show them the truth, to show them their need. Now, Lord, as we look into your word tonight, I pray that you would open it up. Help us to be receptive to it. Help us to see exactly what it is that we need to see. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so we are in part three of our final instructions. Now, we are skipping Colossians, but if you wanted to know uh, what we would have talked about if we were in Colossians, would have been Colossians 4-5. Uh, it's just a small section of what Paul had said. Uh, and he said, uh, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time and let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now that's, that's important, is it not? And so uh, I, I couldn't spend an entire lesson on just a few verses there, but they are important. But Paul also repeats the same information uh, in other ways throughout the rest of these letters. And so we're going to see that all over again. Tonight we're going to be in Philippians. Philippians chapter number 4, verse 1 through 20. And it is, a, it is a long section, but I believe we can get it done tonight, okay? Um, it's broken down into a couple of parts. Uh, this, this deals with rejoicing to start with. In verse 1 through 4, that's where we will start. So let's read this, and we'll do it section by section. And so the very first thing I want you to see is this matter of rejoicing. Now, as Paul closes this letter to the book, in, to the book here, to the Philippian believers, um, I want you to realize that the Philippian believers... They were under some persecution. All of these churches that Paul is writing to, all of these believers were facing a certain levels of persecution. Some of the persecution was primarily from the Jewish people, and some came from the Romans, some were a mix of both. Uh, these Philippians, their persecution was a mixture. There were the Jews who were, who were persecuting the church and there were also the Romans persecuting uh, the believers because they saw Christianity uh, as a sect of Judaism. And so they just hated the Jewish people and so that's where that persecution came from. So let's look at this, if we will, tonight, verse, verse 1 through 4. Therefore, my beloved, dearly, uh, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, Philippians 4, verse 1, uh, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke, true yoke fellow, help, the, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Now there's a couple of important things to understand in this little section. As Paul is coming to a close in this book, it is an appeal to believers to live a rejoicing life in the Lord, to not let everything around you distract you. 
How many of y'all would agree with me tonight, the Bible's right when it says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's those little irritating things. Sometimes it's little irritating things about people, is it not? Their nature, their character just rubs you wrong. And sometimes it's just those little things that can keep you from living a joyful existence around someone. We've got to stop and focus on ourselves. We've got to stop and focus on who we are and what we are in Christ. Verse number one, he says that we're brethren. You and I today, we need to understand that in the church, in the body of the church, it's no different than it was in this day. There are going to be people who are slow to react and people who are very quick to react. There are people that are very patient and there are people who are very impatient. There are people that are very loving and kind and sweet. And there are people who are, let's just say, not so loving, so kind and so sweet. And it is you and I that have to examine ourselves. Would you all agree with that? We have to examine ourselves. And if we're going to live this joy-filled life that Paul wants the believers to, to, to live, um, then we need to examine ourselves and make sure that we're not the problem. Because, folks, whenever we have a bunch of people and they're all a bunch of problems, the problem really isn't all those bunch of people. It's probably us. Have you ever noticed that about yourself? I've noticed that about myself a time or two, and it's a harsh reality to come to. But what's their problem? What's their problem? What's their problem? What's their problem? They don't have a problem. I'm the problem. Now, if just one people have a problem, maybe they do have a problem. You understand what I'm saying, right? Okay, so notice this. He says to the brethren, dearly beloved. You also are dearly beloved. If you want to have some joy tonight, first of all, it starts with being in, in the brotherhood. Are you saved? Uh, have you been washed in the blood? If you are, then you're the family of God. No matter what inconsistencies there are in the family, you're in the family. And you also are the dearly beloved. And notice that next phrase, and longed for. The Lord wants you to be with Him as much as you want to be with the Lord. Tonight, I want you to realize we as Christian people ought to have a natural desire to want to leave this sin-cursed world, be separated from this sin-cursed body, and be present with our Lord and Savior. Wouldn't it be wonderful tonight if we could not sin anymore? Wouldn't it be wonderful tonight if we didn't feel pain anymore? Wouldn't it be wonderful tonight if we didn't have to worry about how we're going to die and what sicknesses we're going to have and all of that. Wouldn't it be wonderful not to have any disagreements with anybody? And not all, you realize that once we are saved and in glory, none of that stuff's going to happen. That's good news, right? And so he says that we're longed for. The brethren are longed for by God. But God is long-suffering. And there are lots of lost people in this world that the Lord, in His long-suffering, are giving a space of time to be saved. We need to realize that. As much as we'd like to be gone from our sin curse and a sin cursed body and a sin cursed world, we have a responsibility. And the responsibility that we have can bring us joy if we do it for the Lord. And the responsibility we have is to live for the glory of God. Our responsibility is to get the gospel out around the world. Our responsibility is to maintain a good testimony uh, in the, the lost world as well as the saved world, we have a lot of responsibility. And they're not burdens when you're doing it because you know the Lord loves you and He's longing for you as well. Now, I want you to see the next verse. He says this, and we're going to back up to the end of verse 1 in just a second. He says, I beseech Iodius and I beseech Syntyche. Now, Iodius has the idea of being a rapid, uh, instant, Make a decision. And Syntyche has the idea of, it's, it kind of rhymes with the word to synthesize. Let's think about this. Let's take our time. Let's put it together. Let's not rush into anything. Yodius is like, let's get it done now. Let's jump right in. Let's get it done. And these two people were at odds with each other in the church. And so he says, I beseech Yodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. The reason is, is that they were beloved. 
they were in the family. They were to be experiencing the joy of the Lord. They were to be longed for by God the same. This one and this one were both longed for by the Lord. But they had a problem. They couldn't get along. They were at odds one with another. Their very names tell their very, their very nature. And they're at odds. And I can guarantee you, and please don't blurt it out, but if I were to ask you, who is it that you are at odds with in this church, I guarantee you, if you're doing any work in this church, you're going to find that there's somebody at odds with you. It is a normal, natural course of events. We are brothers and sisters. Did you always get along with your brothers and sisters growing up? If you're an only child, you, you, this doesn't pertain to you. You don't have a clue. But if you have brothers and sisters, then you know that you didn't always get along, and yet you're still family. Everybody got that, right? Remember, he's talking about an appeal to rejoice in the Lord. Look back at the end of verse number one. He says that they're longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. If Yodius was standing fast in the Lord and Syntyche was standing fast in the Lord and they both loved the Lord, but one was like, let's go, let's get it done. What you, why are you dragging your feet? What's your problem? And the other one's like, now wait a minute, we need to think about this, we need to take time, don't rush headlong into anything, Let's make a wise decision. You understand that there are still those two types of people in every church. Am I right or am I wrong? And it's two different groups within the church. And so he says that we are to stand fast in the Lord. Stay standing fast in the Lord, but don't argue over how things get done or when things get done. The work is the Lord's. This is what we need to learn today. The work wasn't Yodis's. The work wasn't Syntyche's. The work was the Lord's. And if you and I want to have joy in serving the Lord and serving the church, we need to stop doing it ourselves. Back up and allow God to work in us, regardless of our nature, regardless of our, our natural bent towards being headstrong, jump in, or being patient. Just allow God to work. Allow the work to be God's, not ours, and the work will get done. And we then will be less at odds with, with each other. Does that make sense? Let's, let's just put it in perspective here. Let's say that we decided to start a ministry. Let's just say, for example, we decided we're going to start a soup kitchen and a clothes closet. I don't know why anybody would want to do that. There's so many of them out there anyway. But nevertheless, let's say we decided to do that. So we decide we want to have a soup kitchen. Well, there will be a group of people that go, yeah, we got to get it done. we got to get it done right now. And I mean, I, we got to get this out there. And these people, they're hungry and it's got to be done. And so let's get it done. And then there'll be others that are going to go, now, wait a minute. Where are we going to get the food from? How are we going to store the food? What kind of health laws are we talking about? What about the health department? What about the fire department? <laughs> Amen. Am I right? Yes. And so we have to work together. The one who wants to jump headlong they're the perfect one to find all those volunteers, get those volunteers trained and ready. And the ones over here that are like, let's make sure our ducks in a row. They're the best ones to make sure that the food is, is prepared right, that the food is brought in, and that people t are taken care of in an orderly, decent manner. Amen and amen. amen. And we can do these things as a body of believers if we put God first. That is number one right there. And rejoice in the Lord always. Whether you're a Yodius, whether you're a Syntyche, rejoice in the Lord. Allow the work to be the Lord's. Either the Lord opens the church to be a soup kitchen, the Lord gives the burden for a soup kitchen, and the Lord provides for the church to be a soup kitchen, or it wasn't the Lord's doing in the first place. This is something that we have got to learn. Amen? If nobody volunteers to do the job, the job doesn't need to be done. It no longer is the Lord's doing. It may have been His calling to start with. Let's be honest. If nobody wanted to be Sunday school teachers, do you know what that means? That doesn't mean you force people to be Sunday school teachers. You stop. You stop. That goes contrary to our way of thinking in the modern world, doesn't it? Yeah. Nope, we got to do it. Got to have it. It's got to be done. I mean, Sunday school's always been there. No, it hasn't. It's not in the Bible, you see. 
And so what we need to make sure is that we are waiting on the Lord to give us what we need. And if the Lord does not provide what we need, then it is another ministry that we need to seek what the Lord would have us to do. Do you all realize where Sunday school come from? And by the way, we're not shutting down Sunday school. I'm not saying that. Um, but do you all realize where Sunday school came from? In the 1800s, there were children that were slave, basically slave laborers in the factories. And a man had a burden because these children were going into the factories. And the only day they had off was Sunday. And these children were ignorant. They couldn't read and they couldn't write. And do you know where Sunday school was started? Sunday school was started because one man in a church had a burden, brought his burden to the church, and the church worked together, even though there were Yodiuses and there were Syntyches in the church. They worked together to start a Sunday school. Sunday school had nothing to do with the Bible. It taught them math, reading, the, the reading, writing, and arithmetic. That's how Sunday school got started. And in it, they then gave the children the gospel, and the children started to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. They learned how to read, they learned how to write, they learned how to do math, and then they got better jobs and didn't have to work as slave labor. That's how Sunday school got started. And you thought it was Lifeway, right? It's not. And so that was, now think about what it has morphed into. Now what it has morphed into is this humongous spending arm of the local church because we have to buy all this literature and buy all this material and we have to have all these teachers, we have to have all these classrooms. Do you realize that the average church up until the 1900s was just one room? It was the sanctuary. And inside that sanctuary, when the church met for Sunday school, it wasn't to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic anymore. It was to teach the entire church a biblical lesson from the Bible all together, men, women, boys, and girls. And then after the Sunday school hour, there would be the preaching hour. And after the preaching hour, people would go home, take care of their, their animals and their flocks, come back that night, and it would be preaching again that night. That's the way the church was. And now it's big business, you see. Everything is out of whack. And that's what happens when you get a Yodius and a Syntyche that are at odds, and the church, instead of working it out biblically, they yield to whichever one of these yells the loudest. The squeaky wheel gets greased. And the fact of the matter, the only thing we need is preaching, praying, and singing. That's all we need. That's all we need. Y'all get that? All right. So this is where rejoicing comes from. Think about what we hear and what we've always heard. Remember the stories of our grandparents, great-great-grandparents, and our forefathers, how they didn't have a lot of the world's goods, but they met together, they worshiped together, they prayed together, they worked together, they shared their farm implements together, and they rejoiced in the Lord. Well, now we've got everything under the sun. We have every opportunity afforded to us. We have all the Sunday school classes for all the ages. And are we rejoicing in the Lord? Or are we enduring? Are we truly thankful and glad and blessed and happy and can't wait till Sunday comes? Or are we, well, it's one more thing to do on the weekend. Got to give God my one hour. Those types of things. When he's closing this letter, and trust me, this is even though it's the smallest section in the verses wise, it is the biggest section. Because if we have no joy within our own personal self, how can we expect to have joy as a body of believers? And if I don't have joy in myself, how can I not look at the Yodiuses of the world and go, it'll be all right. It's okay. Just relax. Cool your jets. It's fine. And how can I not look at the syntyches of the world and go, you know what? Sometimes spontaneity is a spice of life. Sometimes you don't need to be so analytical. Sometimes you need to just let a few things happen. Am I right or am I wrong? Let's go to the next section. Look at this next section. It's to show moderation. 
Now, again, short verses, but this is really a short section. Let your moderation, and by the way, the word moderation has the idea uh, of not excess. In other words, Yodius was excessive, Syntyche was excessive. We don't want to be excessive in our mood swings. Any of y'all got mood swings? You're up, you're up, you're down, you're down. When, when you ain't happy, you don't want anybody to be happy. Anybody like that? All right, we've got to make sure that we're not in that. So he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. That word careful has the idea of anxiety. Don't be anxious. Don't be fearful. Don't be anxious. Don't dread and worry. Don't live a worrisome lifestyle. But in everything by prayer and supplication, the word supplication means specific requests. Let, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Look at this. And the peace of God, which passeth, passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's no need for us to be stressed. We have a God. We can go to God and tell God all about it. Now, sometimes we learn this the easy way. Sometimes we'll be in church, it'll be preached on, or somebody will remind us of it, and we're like, yeah, you know, that's right. I don't need to be so stressed. Sometimes we wake up in the middle of the night, we can't sleep because everything's on our mind. We're thinking about everything. Anybody like that in here? I mean, you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning worried about whether your milk's sour in the refrigerator or not. I mean, every little thing. And it doesn't really matter. It got sour because you never used it. So what does it matter anyway? But we do that, don't we? The Bible tells us to let our moderation be known unto all men. We're not going to run to these excesses. We're not going to walk around as though uh, we have everything to worry about. Because, to be honest, we're bought and paid for with a price. We are the body of Christ, are we not? He's the head. He tells us we have no stress if we would live a no-stress life. You don't have to worry about anything. God knows all about you. He knows the hairs of your head. He knows your tomorrow. He knows everything about you financially. He knows everything about you physically. He knows everything about you mentally. He knows everything about you spiritually. If you are born again into the family of God, we don't need to worry so much. The Lord said that He feeds the birds. He clothes the fields and the lilies. And how much greater are we than that? He'll take care of us. Our God is a great and a mighty God. Paul said, and we talked about it the other week, Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. I know how to have nothing and I know how to have everything. And folks, he said, I have learned therewith to be content. When I have nothing, when I have everything, I can be content. Because his contentment didn't come from the stuff. His contentment didn't come from the happenings of the world or even his social interaction. It came from Jesus. The Lord gives us peace. And that's exactly what he's talking about. Be careful for nothing. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So if you wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning tonight, and you're worried about what's going to happen in your family, and you're worried about the finances, and you're worried about your health, this is what you do. Lord, I sure am anxious. And you said for me not to be. You said cast all our care upon you because you care for us. And that verse means this, if you break it down in the actual verbiage. Take all of your anxiety and throw it as far as you can away from you. Give it to the Lord and don't return to it because the Lord has a passion for you, a love for you, a care for you. And that's what that means. And so we need to do that. Lord, I can't deal with this. Lord, I, I'm driving myself crazy. Lord, I'm frustrating myself. I'm worrying myself sick. You ever worry yourself sick? I've done it. It's a stupid place to be, but we do it, don't we? As human beings, we get there. It's a miserable place to be, is it not? I, I remember many times in my life, now worrying about how I'm going to deal with some situation at church. Because whether y'all know it or not, you, you made me gray, you see. 
And there have been some really, some, some serious issues that I've had to deal with at church since I've been here. And there have been some nights where I'd be up all night just sick on my stomach because I don't, I'm not naturally one to be confrontational or, 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 or to fight. I, I, that's really not me. I would rather just preach the word and you get it and behave yourself. You know what I'm saying, right? But let's just be honest. We don't always do that, do we? And so sometimes there are things that have to be dealt with. And I, I have many times woken up in the middle of the night so sick over something like this. Just so anxious, so sick. And I'd go to the Lord and eventually the Lord would just give me peace. And I'd get back to sleep. And I have found that when I just allow God to handle most of these issues, there are some things I still have to deal with. But when I allow God to handle it, He takes care of it in a way. And if I would have handled it, I'd have probably messed it up. God has a better way. Let God be God, y'all. And let God take care of your problems. God is a great problem solver, is He not? So let's look at the next one. The third section is thinking clearly. So if we're going to understand this closing and it's an appeal to rejoice in the Lord... It starts there with that rejoicing and understanding that we're all different and understanding that we've got to get along in all of our differences. And you can get along in your differences if you so choose. Put the Lord first, yes? And then the second one was to show moderation. And truly, folks, we can show that moderation. We can cast our care upon the Lord. We can stop with all the anxiety attacks. Now, if you suffer from anxiety attacks, and I have in the past, they come out of the blue. It's not your fault. Let me just help you with that. Anybody in here suffer with them? You're willing to admit that? I'm telling you, or have in the past. Yes, absolutely. They come out of the blue, don't they? It's not that you have a deficiency. It comes out of the blue. It's what you do with it when they hit you. At first, you're overwhelmed. You don't know what to do. You're just absolutely mentally frazzled. And you can't get a grasp of reality. If you've never had a panic attack and you've never dealt with panic like that, it is debilitating. You just want to find a hole, get in it, and hide till the world is gone. It's a terrible place to be. But after a while, you've got to come to a reality that this is not the best way to be. This is not the natural way to be as a Christian. And you've got to carry it to the Lord and let the Lord help you with that problem. Amen? Everybody with me on that, right? And so next is the thinking clear. Look at verse verse number 6 through 9. I know I read 5 through 7, but back up to 6 through 9. Be careful for nothing. We talked about that with the anxiety part. But in everything be by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You've got to be thinking clearly to do that, do you not? If you need to go to God, I, I'm telling you, when you don't even know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays for you. How many of y'all have read that in the Bible? That's some real good news tonight. That is some real good news. And even He'll make groanings, which you, you just... You ever be so to the place, you don't have words, you're just like, oh, oh. You ever been there? Let me tell you something, the Holy Spirit will pray for you. He knows what you need. And God is there for you. But you've got to come to that clear thinking. And when you come to that clear thinking, then and only then can you come to God in the right fashion with a with a clarity. God, you can handle my problems. Because when we're in a panic attack and when we're having anxiety attacks, I want you to know the last thing we really feel like doing is putting all of our, per- our problems on the Lord because we're not even thinking clearly that way. And to be honest with you, we start to wonder, does God have the power? And anybody that have anxiety want to agree with me? We start to doubt God. Because that is just the way human beings are. But when we come to that clarity, then clarity of thought allows us to go right straight to God. And then we find that peace again. It is the peace of God that gives you clear thinking. It is the peace of God that floods your soul. And tonight, no matter what you're going through, no matter what difficulty you're going through, no matter what issues you're facing in life, no matter where your uh, anxiety is about the future, 
I want you to know this, there is still peace with the Lord. You have the Comforter on the inside. The Holy Spirit of God, yes, He does chasten you. Yes, He does correct you. Yes, He does rebuke you, but He also comforts you. And He is called the Comforter for that reason. He is our peace. And if you will go to the Lord, you get that clear thinking, and you go to the Lord, He'll give you peace. There are things in my life that come sometime, and like I told you, they, they cause me to have that anxiety. I wake up in the middle of the night. How am I going to handle this? I'm going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. or I don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to cause a problem, a bigger problem than what it is. And I worry about And then the Lord will just give me a peace. When the peace comes from the Lord, I have clear thinking. And I can clearly stop and go, you know what? It's not as big as I'm making it. My mama used to tell me, boy, you make mountains out of molehills. And now I know exactly what she means. And we all do that as human beings, do we not? It is universal. But some make bigger molehills or bigger mountains and some make smaller mountains. But we all do it. Look at the next verse, verse number eight and, and verse number nine. Finally, brethren, as he comes to a close... And the last section is basically using Paul's life as a reminder. We're going to get there in just a few minutes. Using Paul's life as a reminder and using it as an example. He says this to these brethren here at Philippi. Finally, brethren, this is his final remarks for the finality of all finalities. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Look at that. Think about that for a minute. Our minds, the way we think, affects our joy. That's what he's saying. Remember, he started out with Yodis and Syntyche, and this one wanted to hurry up and get it done. You know why they had to hurry up and get it done? They had to, they had to just jump because that's the way they thought. If I don't get it done, it's not going to get done. Them other people over there, they'll drag their feet. I got to get it done. No. We got to get it done. And this one over here, what were their faulty thinking? Well, I just don't know what, why they get their bloomers in a bunch. There's always going to be poor people. We just need to take our time. Well, sadly, the Syntyches of the world would never get anything done. They'd never tell anybody about Jesus. They'd never get anything done in the church. Am I right? They'd have to analyze everything. And it would never get done. And so there has to be a joining together. There has to be a joyous atmosphere. There has to be a joy from Jesus. There has to be rejoicing together, allowing the Lord to do the work. There has got to be this spirit of unity together, allowing the, war, the Lord to do the work. And that can't happen if you're anxious and, and, and worried about everything. If you, this side worries and this side worries and they have their fears and anxiety, anxieties and worries and this side has their fears and anxieties and worries and they're not taking it to the Lord and they're not showing moderation, then they're going to live extreme, both sides, and you'll never come to a concluding matter. Some of y'all work with people like that, don't you? You have people at your work like that. You have people in your family like that. And it feels so very schizophrenic, does it not? And nothing gets accomplished, a lot gets talked about, but nothing gets done. And I want you to know that's why it is like that in many churches. A lot of talk, nothing gets done. Because they cannot come to a conclusion about the solution and then work it out. Everybody has their own ideas. By the way, it's been that way in the body of believers for a long time. Remember back in the book of Judges, everybody did that which was right in their own eyes, and that is a form of what he's talking about. Then we get things right. We take it to the Lord. And then we have the peace that comes in 
but we have got to have this clear thinking. And so he says, stop. This is what you need to think about. Don't think about the task at hand. Let's be real honest here tonight. Let's say you go home, your sink's backed up, your toilet's backed up, you got a sewer problem, you got to handle it, don't you? You got to deal with it. It's not going to go away. You got to deal with it. So what do you do? You deal with it. Am I right? Because you have a problem, you're faced with a problem, the problem has to be taken care of, and if you can't fix it yourself, you have to hire somebody to fix it. Sadly, in the church, we're not like that. In the church, we have a problem. We come in on Sunday morning, the sink's backed up, the sewer's backed up, and all of a sudden, you got 200 ideas, 200 different ways of doing it. Am I right or wrong? And this one's mad because they didn't, this one over here said they didn't like their idea, and this one's mad because they didn't, over here didn't like their idea. Am I right or am I wrong? <laughs> and we've already predetermined if it's so bad, if it's that bad, we're calling in the professionals, okay? But the thing is, this is way, the way we are. We've got to stop, back off of the problem. Do you realize in every church there's somebody to handle that problem? We don't all need to deal with it. There's somebody that deals with it. Let the somebody who deals with it deal with it and don't worry about how it gets done. Let's say we're going to buy new lights. Guess what? Everybody's going to have a different idea of what light to buy. Everybody's going to have a different idea of what color. Everybody's going to have a different idea of how high or how low. Everybody's going to have a different idea of which kind of light, which brand of light, who puts them in. You know what? The church is better off to predetermine they take care of that and let it be done. That way you don't have these problems. And you don't focus on that issue. You focus on the things that Paul said focus on. Nowhere in here, look at this list. Nowhere in here is the color of the carpet. Nowhere in here is who's going to sing a special. Nowhere in here is who's going to fix what. Nowhere in here, it's not in here, is it? All the little issues and problems we have at church. Look what Paul said. Whatsoever things are true. What's the truth he's talking about? He's not talking about the truth of taking care of your building. He's talking about the truth of God's Word. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to think on that which is true, you think on the Word of God. You think on God the Word. You think about Jesus Christ. He's the true. Stop focusing on all the problems and focus on Jesus. I firmly believe that if churches would focus more on Jesus and less on themselves, if they'd focus more on Jesus and less about their preferences, if we could get back to church being, preaching, praying, and singing, worshiping our God, and magnifying find the name of Jesus, we would have a whole lot less problems in church. We have a whole lot less issues, would we not? Absolutely. Whatsoever things are true, that's the Lord. Whatsoever things are honest, what's he talking about? The honesty. Again, he's talking about that which is honest to the Word of God. Pure doctrine. Think about your honest doctrine. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. The fact that Jesus is God. Focus on those honest things, those true things that we learn as a body of believers. Whatsoever things are just. What's he talking about? He's talking about a God who is just and holy and right. All of these things focus to the Lord, you see. Whatsoever things are pure. Who's the purest one? It ain't us. It's Jesus. He's pure. He's the pure and perfect Lamb of God. Think on Him. Whatsoever things are lovely. He's the lovely Lord Jesus. How many of y'all have heard that? He is lovely. Focus on that which is lovely. It's about Jesus. Church is about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's not about everything else. It's about Jesus. We people make it about everything else. It's about Jesus. He is the Lord. He is lovely. He is beautiful. We need to focus on Him. Whatsoever things are of a good report. You want to know the greatest report there ever is? 
The greatest report that ever comes out of a church isn't, hey, our toilet ain't backed up anymore. I mean, that can be some good news, if you understand. But the greatest thing is this. We serve a risen Savior. He is alive forevermore. He'll save to the other. He is coming again. You want a good report? I'll give you a good report. There are people that are still getting saved. There are families that are still being put back together. There's still the name of Jesus being magnified around the world. That's a good report. We still have missionaries on the field preaching the gospel to a lost and dying world. That's a good report. Think on that. Look what he says. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. What's virtuous? What is so holy, pure, and righteous as our Lord Jesus Christ? What is more worthy of our praise? God deserves all of our praise. So if we're going to think about anything worthy of praise, it's God. It's God. But what do we do as people? We want to think about what we've done and how we ought to be praised for it. Now, we don't do it here, and I know there are many churches that do, but they have plaques and little placards on everything. And those things, I mean, I understand why people are doing it. They're trying to show honor to those who give. But sadly, sometimes... In some places, in some churches, it can get to the place where more honor is given to whomever gave something than to the Lord Jesus. I was doing a revival at a church, and it said right in the front where they had the Lord's Supper, this do in remembrance of me, and right beside the me was a plaque, and it was given by so-and-so in memory of so-and-so and so-and-so. So who are you doing in memory of? Whomever is on that plaque, you see. And that's not the Lord. Had you removed that plaque, you would have found out whether that person was a Syntyche or a Yodius, wouldn't you? You'd have found out just how personal that stuff is. Church isn't personal. Church is about the person of Jesus. Our relationship with the Father through Jesus is personal. But what we do here is corporate towards God. Is that right? Are y'all with me tonight? Do you see it? Have you ever thought about it that way? Finally, here's the last one. We are to use Paul's life as an example. Longest section, but the shortest portion tonight. Look at verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me uh, hath flourished again. Now notice this. This church gave to Paul as he was about his missionary journey. They were loving. They were giving people. And so, folks, they had some good stuff about them. Paul was addressing Yodis and Syntyche because that seemed to be a a problem in that congregation. And it is a problem from time to time in every congregation. Would you agree? And so he didn't end there. He said, here's how you do it. You cast that to the Lord. Give it to the Lord. Surrender that. Rejoice in the Lord. Get rid of that stress and that anxiety. Stop trying to have your own way because really that's where all this stress comes from. And give it to the Lord. And once you have given it to the Lord, then think on the things that keep the peace inside of you, that keep you living a life of peace. And it's about thinking about Jesus. Think about your Savior. Think about your God. And then he says this. He says, I rejoice because you guys showed me love. You showed me care. He wasn't bashing them. He wasn't cutting them. He wasn't rebuking them. He was showing them they had an area that needed a little work. It shows the pastoral part of Paul. Many times we read the the writings of Paul and we think, boy, he was awful brash. He really wasn't. We read it that way. He was very loving and very thankful for the love that he received from the church. Look, and I'm done. Wherein you also were careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned, and here it is, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and how to abound, how to be poor and how to be wealthy. 
everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. That's all of us. Now, we may not be cast in a prison. We may not have great swells of wealth and losses of wealth. But all of us go through this in our personal life with personal things. Sometimes they are relationships. Sometimes it's through family. It can be your wealth. It can be your health. It can be any number of things. And you've learned as you've grown older in Christ, as you're matured in Christ, all you need is Jesus. Why? Because hopefully you've gotten to that place where you stop and your thought processes is not on how you're going to make it through it, but on how you're going to glorify God as you watch Him lead you through it. If God brought you to it, He'll see you through it. It all depends on our perspective, does it not? I can do all things. You can rejoice and you can live a joy-filled life. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can. That's what we need is a can-do attitude in our church, in every church, in the church in America. We need some can-do attitude. A can-do attitude is not an arrogant attitude. A can-do attitude means that I can do all things through Christ. Why? It's Christ that leads me to it. It's Christ that gives me strength to do it. It's Christ's glory. It's for Christ's honor. It's for Christ. And when you're thinking about Jesus and you're thinking about Christ instead of anxiety and stress and worry and you can't help but see the victory in Jesus Himself. He got up out of the grave, y'all. If he can conquer the grave, he can conquer anything. And so we can trust in him. And I can do all things. I can do the things that scare me. I can do the things that I dread. I can do the things that I like. I can do the things that bring me joy. I can do all things through Christ. As long as it's through Christ. And he gives us strength to do it. Notwithstanding, you have well done. Look at that. Paul wasn't hurting them. He was helping them. You have done well uh, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church uh, communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. They were the only ones that were worried about Paul's welfare as he traveled. For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again under my necessity, but because I desire to gift, not because I desire to gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now, don't let those um, charlatans take this verse and tell you that means you need to give money to everything, right? But I have all and, and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need. You gave. Now God will take care of you. That is still a biblical principle. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and forever. What a beautiful way to, to close this out, was it not? Now I want you to see next week we're going to be in the book. Um, we're going to be to the Ephesians. A little bit more doctrinal stuff. This is more Christianity 101 practical stuff. But I want you to see this tonight. And if you've never seen it this way, this is what I want you to know. As we close tonight, this is what I want you to know. We are just like the Philippians. If you're saved tonight, you've done some good. You do things well. You also make mistakes. And you do some things wrong. Yes? God is faithful. And God started a work in you, however long ago it was. And that same God is going to see it unto completion. And when He completes it, how glorious it's going to be. But until He completes it, we're a work in progress. We're not finished yet. We still have a lot to learn. We still have a lot of growing to do. And we still have a lot to learn about ourselves about others, 
and about our Savior, don't we? Amen. Amen. All right. Anybody have any questions, cares, comments, concerns? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. And I was suicidal. Um, you know, I had a very young child. And it, was, it, it truly was a point. I just did not think that I was going to make it. And the only thing I could think of was just God, I, I just had to make sure that God knew that I, I trusted him, but I didn't know that I was to trust him. Yes. And I, find, I realized that I had this sense of entitlement that I didn't understand where it was coming from. And it's, it's a psych, psychologically proven that when you have a grateful heart and you can be grateful for all things in everything that God provides for us through Jesus, that that starts relieving the anxiety. Yes. Yes. And that those grateful virtues have they have to. They have to be in your heart. They have to. Yes. Because if they don't, you're not in true gratefulness. And it was and it's taken me seven to eight years to realize that piece of it where now I can I can function. Yes. Right. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Yes, amen. It will. You learn the light when you're in the darkness. You learn the strength of God when you are at the worst and the bottom. And you learn. This is the soul crown. Yes. Yeah. You, you never really, and, and you said something that I think is so true, and we're going to pray and dismiss here in just a minute, but it's so true. Many times we talk about this, but do you know what it means? Do you really know what it means to surrender? Do you know what it means to live a joyful life? Do you know what it means, or is it still something you're just talking about? Because you truly learn to rely on the Lord and trust in the Lord when you have nothing else to rely and trust in. I always tell people going to Bible college wasn't for my education. It was so I could learn to trust the Lord. Because otherwise, we would have failed and quit. You can't, it financially didn't make sense. It, family didn't, it, it didn't make any sense. But it was what the Lord was doing, bringing us to a very place that we had to be a base so that we learn to trust the Lord and see that the Lord was faithful and we didn't have to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. The Lord 
would lift us up. And the Lord would fill us up. And I think so many times we Christian people talk about the joy and we talk about faith. But you truly learn it in the darkness. You truly do. It is a learned thing. And thank you, Trina. Thank you. Amen. All right, y'all ready to go home? All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you once again for just allowing us the opportunity to gather together tonight. We ask you that you'd watch over us as we go our separate ways, keep us safe and secure till we can meet again. And Father, uh, we just want to thank you for everything, but most of all, for salvation for sinners like us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys have a good night.